If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and take a moment to attempt the question on your own. It turns out that we can first calculate I1 by applying Kirchhoff's loop rule to the upper loop. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves of what Kirchhoff's loop rule is. You can certainly pause the screen here and read this statement over a couple of times, but it does say that the sum of the potential differences across all the elements around any closed circuit loop must equal zero. Now, maybe a bit of a mouthful, but we can understand it by looking at the top half of this loop and selecting an arbitrary starting point. For example, as a starting point, we can choose the upper right portion of the circuit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go around the loop. Now, this is also a matter of personal choice. You could go around the loop in a clockwise fashion, so that would be in this direction, or alternatively, you can work your way through the loop in a counterclockwise fashion. Again, it really doesn't matter. You're going to end up getting correct answers regardless. In our case, we'll just simply choose to go in the counterclockwise direction. So we're going to start at this point. We're going to move counterclockwise through the upper half of the circuit. And as we do that, we're going to see that we encounter several elements. For example, we encounter the 15 volt battery, the seven ohm resistor, the five ohm resistor, as well as the ammeter. And as we encounter these elements, we have to keep a couple of things in mind. As you move your way through the loop, if you encounter a battery and you're traveling from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, then your delta V value is going to be positive. And we will see in a moment exactly what that means. If you are moving against the current, and we've shown the current flowing to the right in this picture, if you're moving against the current, your delta V is also positive. On the other hand, if you encounter a battery and you move from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, then your delta V will be negative. Also, if you are moving with the current, and again, the current is shown, then your delta V is negative. So these ideas we really want to keep in mind. We'll keep them up on the screen as we start at this point and work our way through the loop. One more point that needs to be mentioned. When we encounter a resistor, which is represented by these jagged lines, the delta V will be calculated as the product of current and resistance. And again, we're going to see more precisely what that means as we go through the loop. So these three ideas we need to keep in mind. Why don't we begin at this point and work our way in a counterclockwise fashion. And as we do that, we'll be keeping track of delta V values. So we move from the point and we encounter a battery. And you'll notice that we are moving from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. As noted in that situation, the delta V will be positive. More specifically, it's going to be positive 15 volts. So we can write a positive 15 here. I will omit using the unit of volts. Let's just assume that all these numbers will be in volts. So we pass through the battery and then we encounter this resistor. And we'll notice that the current was previously labeled on the figure. We can kind of extend it, maybe add an arrowhead here, and show that this purple line is indeed the current that was labeled as I1. Now notice that as we move through the loop, we're moving with the direction of that current. And we had stated that when you move with the direction of current, your delta V is negative. So we will put a negative sign into the formula. Furthermore, remember that when we encounter a resistor, we have to calculate delta V by using a current times a resistance. A current times a resistance. But the resistance is given as seven. The current in this part of the loop is I1. So we're going to multiply that current, I1, times the resistance, which is seven ohms. Again, we'll omit units for simplicity. So we've passed that resistor, we come down here, and then we stay within the upper loop and we encounter another resistor. And actually, the figure did not label a current through this resistor, but we can perhaps use some common sense to determine whether the current should be pointing to the left or whether it should be pointing to the right instead. If we look at this junction right here, we can see that current two and current one are both flowing into that junction. You can almost imagine that water would be flowing along and entering a point right here. Now, once the current from both directions gets to this point, it has to turn right. There's just no choice for it otherwise. And when it turns right, we can see then that the current through this little section of the circuit would be flowing to the right. So hopefully that makes sense. Furthermore, the question noted that the current was two amps. How do we know that? Well, because it says the ammeter 
reads two amps and this structure right here is the ammeter. So basically this little circle here is measuring the amount of current that's going through this section of the circuit and it is indeed two amps. So we are moving our way through the loop. We are going with the current. So once again, when we move with the current, our delta V is negative and the delta V is equal to the current times the resistance. So we'll have a negative and then the current, which was two, multiplied by the resistance here, which was five. We continue along, we go through the ammeter. We do not have to keep track of any current as we go through the ammeter, generally speaking at least. And then we come back up to where we started. And once we reach our starting point, Kirchhoff's loop rule tells us to set this equal to zero. And we now have a relatively simple equation that we can solve. We can multiply the two and five to simplify. We can also call this term seven I one. We can then add the seven I to the right side of the equation. 15 minus 10 is five, of course. And then once we divide both sides by seven, we would get approximately 0.714 amps equal to the value of current one. So we've labeled I1 with the value 0.714 amps. We've also included two amps, which was the current measured by the ammeter. We can next easily find I2. And to do that, we can use what's called the junction rule. Now hopefully it's pretty clear that I2 is entering this junction right here. It's pointing towards it. Similarly, I1 is also entering that junction because it too is pointing towards it. This current, the two amp current, is leaving or going out of the junction. And the junction rule simply says that the total current in is equal to the total current out. Pretty intuitive idea, perhaps. So for the total current in, we'll add I1 and I2 and then set it equal to the current out, which was the two amps. We'll subtract both sides by 0.714, and we will see that I2 is equal to approximately 1.29 amps. So that would be the correct answer for I2. Finally, to calculate this EMF, we can apply the loop rule once again. This time, we'll start in the lower right corner, and we will proceed in a clockwise direction. You could obtain the correct answer by going counterclockwise as well, remember. So we'll go through this a little more quickly this time. We're moving and we're going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So according to this figure, we'll have a positive change in voltage. In this case, that would be the symbol shown here. We then move through the two ohm resistor and hopefully we can see, particularly if we extend I2 back a little bit, that we are moving with the current. We are moving with I2. And when we move with the current, we will have a negative change in voltage equal to a current times a resistance. Now the current in this section was just determined as 1.29. The resistance is shown as two. We continue our way through the loop. We make a turn right here. And then we are going with the current once again. So we're gonna have a negative change in voltage and it's equal to the product of the current and the resistance. We go through the ammeter and then return to where we started so we can set that equal to zero. And now all we have to do is add this term and this term to the other side and that will allow us to calculate the EMF, which turns out to be 12.6 volts. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel. Also, you are welcome to send in your own question and I will do my best to provide a video solution to it.